Okay, so for part three of the sound stimulus and the ear, we are going to talk about the inner ear. So how we're actually doing the transduction and the aspects of the inner ear that help us to um, get that information about pitch, loudness, and timbre. And I am going to start back at this picture where we, um, so the stirrup stapes is pushing and pulling on that oval window, which is a membrane, and that push-pull is causing, so in this inner ear, what we're looking at here, so remember this is like a shell, and it's going up from the base, from the bottom, up into what's called the apex, and that little tip in the middle, and then it's it has two pieces and parts here, the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. And the oval window is pushing and pulling on this liquid up in that scala vestibuli, and so it's put that pushes that liquid in such a way that it waves, right, like an, like an ocean wave through the scala vestibuli, goes up to the apex, and then comes back down the scala tympani and hits the round window. And so what's happening with this ocean wave, with this wave of liquid, or these, these waves, is they are affecting the basilar membrane or the cochlear partition. The cochlear partition is that middle part there. So the scala vestibuli on top, and again, this is just a cross section from a cadaver, so they look empty, but there would be liquid in there. And then coming back down, the scala tympani on the bottom, and the cochlear partition is there in between them uh, in the center. And we're looking here at another cross section. So again, it's really hard. A lot of times it's really hard to imagine all of what's going on in the inner ear because it is this shell and we're always looking at it from um, different kinds of perspectives. But so showing that scale of vestibuli, so I'm looking at the bottom picture, um, showing the scale of vestibuli and the scale of tympani where that liquid's going to be. And then the center part, you can see that it's labeled the organ of corti. So our cochlear partition has that organ of corti as part of it. And if we were going to magnify that and move it up to the top there, that organ of corti includes the basilar membrane, uh, which is a membrane. And then you can see that that's connected through this membranous kind of tissue um, with the tectorial membrane at the top, which is that blue looking kind of tongue. And that on the basilar membrane, we have lots of cells, lots of support cells that I'm going to ignore. And then those cells that are colored in the dark red, the inner hair cells are in, in towards the um, where all that connection, connective tissue is, and the outer hair cells are farther out. And so you can see we have more outer hair cells than inner hair cells because we're seeing about four outer hair cells for that specific for one inner hair cell. This is just a scanning micro pictograph showing some of that and it's labeled and so it's cool to see this um, in actuality instead of some animated or drawn cross section. Okay, and if we explain of what so the inner and outer hair cells, remember they're living on that basilar membrane, a basilar membrane supporting or as the base of the organ of corti, that basilar membrane because of the way that liquid waves through there is going to vibrate up and down with that wave in response to sound. And living on that basal membrane, we have the inner hair cells, so they're going to be the ones responsible for the transduction, transduction through the bending of cilia. The outer hair cells are going to increase the vibration of the basilar membrane. We're going to see why this is important. And you can see again that there are about 12,000 outer hair cells per ear, about 3,500 inner hair cells per ear, and so um, almost, almost four times as many outer hair cells as inner hair cells. And then on top of that, connected to the basilar membrane, we have the tectorial membrane, and it's extending over those hair cells. And these hair cells, we're going to see they have little cilia, so they, which look like little hairs, which is how they get their name. They have these little cilia that the tectorial membrane, as it extends over those hair cells, they're going to push and pull on those cilia.
Again, it is the inner hair cells that are doing the job of transduction. And I have my word art there in an attempt to remind myself to sing it, although I'm pretty good about remembering that anymore as I've been doing this for years. And I do, it is this magical thing that turns these aspects of our world into something the brain can understand. Those in, inner hair cells are gonna depolarize and release neurotransmitter. They're gonna hyperpolarize and stop the release of neurotransmitter. They're actually dropping glutamate or releasing glutamate onto the auditory nerve. That um, auditory transduction in blue up there, it is a link. Uh, it's a really good, it's a really good reminder or another good video. I do not have it as required because I feel like I do do this, but it, do, it does have some good animations in it. So I'll, I'll strongly recommend it. I'm gonna do some reminders here that remember we're moving from an air system, that information coming through the air, being captured by the pinna or pinnae, um, being funneled down the auditory canal, hitting the eardrum, which is communicating to the ossicles. Those ossicles are um, pushing and pulling on the oval window and we're getting this into a fluid system. So the, we have the cochlear fluid in there that is affecting, because it has these kind of waves, it's affecting the basal membrane, and it's gonna come back down that, that wave. That wave is gonna hit the round window. And I feel like depending on how you learn the best, um, watch the videos, listen to my video with the pictures, or look at the, the written, this is, here's our process in language. The penna funnels air pressure waves into the auditory canal. The tympanic membrane is gonna vibrate back and forth in time with those sound waves. That tympanic membrane is gonna push and pull on the malleus, which pushes and pulls on the incus, which pushes and pulls on the stapes, which pushes and pulls on the oval window, another membrane that is gonna send, send these pressure bulges of the cochlear fluid moving down the scale of vestibuli, displacing the basilar membrane up and down. So the basilar membrane is moving up and down. As the basilar membrane is moving up and down, if you kind of go back in your mind to the way it is connected with that tectorial membrane, which comes across the top, it is causing this push and pull on the tectorial membrane such that it is shearing back and forth across the organ of corti, moving the cilia, which are the little hair-like looking things protruding from the hair cells back and forth. And as it's, it's flexing these cilia back and forth, we're, we're going uh, depolarization, hyperpolarization, depolarization, hyperpolarization, as I'm being pushed and pulled is depolarization, uh, no, pushed is deep, I think. Pushed is depolarization, pulled is hyperpolarization. Pushed, depolarization, pull, hyperpolarization. And so every time I'm being pushed open, or I'm put, being pushed and I'm opening these little, um, these little tip links or opening these channels, that cochlear fluid is allowing for potassium and calcium to go into the hair cell. And you can see they're both positively charged excitatory ions. And then that's gonna cause a neurotransmitter release into the synapse to communicate with auditory nerve fibers. And we're actually releasing glutamate, which your authors don't mention, but, but there you go. Okay, so neurotransmitters are released onto the auditory nerve fibers, and now we have action potentials in the auditory nerve fibers carried to the brain. We can get to that information to the brain and we go, yay, we got it to the brain like we did with vision, um, except we're, gonna, we're actually gonna stay here a little while longer to talk about what exactly those inner hair cells and what the outer hair cells are doing and how we are coding for pitch. And I'll start with what the outer hair cells are doing as part of this auditory transduction is what, what's happening with them when that tectorial membrane is pushing and pulling on their little cilia. So we get the stimulus, the basilar membrane vibrates, that causes the inner hair cell cilia to bend and we communicate with the auditory nerve. Right? So we get auditory nerve activity. So that's our top band there. That's basically our auditory transduction, what we just went through with um, the many, many processes that go into that. But we have that 
basilar membrane vibrating. And you can see this circular thing that my friend Dr. Robin Horace created somehow. And we're going to call this a motile response, right? And so I'm vibrating and the outer hair cell cilia bend as well. So the tectorial membrane push, and this is what our picture off to the lower right shows, the tectorial membrane pushes on those cilia and it causes a chemical reaction such that the cell elongates. So they basically push down on the basilar membrane at that point. Tectorial membrane pulls back and the cell contracts. So I'm going to pull up. And so we have this motile response. I'm amplifying the action on the basilar membrane at that point, at that, at that point where the tectorial membrane is pushing and pulling. I get pushed and pulled, and then I push and pull on the basilar membrane. We're going to see that this really sharpens our ability to hear at lower amplitude sounds or at lower intensities. If we look at how we code for frequency or our coding for pitch, um, how the, what this is happening on the basilar membrane, now we're going to come back to uh, those inner hair cells. So we have a couple of theories for how we code for pitch. Um, the earlier theory, I think, I think it was earlier, it's been around for a long time, the place theory of Jörg von Bekesey basically says that the pitch that we hear is going to depend on the place along the on, along the basilar membrane where neural firing is highest. And so when we look at that wave, if you think about how an ocean wave or if you kind of pull a rope and it and you pull it taut and it has this little it's going to have a place where it has a crest, right? Where it's going to be the largest at some point. And it's not just the crest, it's where the, that crest becomes the largest. That's what we're kind of really looking at. And that's what Jörg von Bekesey found uh, when he observed the basilar membrane. Uh, he actually observed this traveling wave in the cadavers of animals. He would present an electrical signal and watch this traveling wave along the basilar membrane. We have to remember that this was the cadavers of animals based on his observations he built a model of the cochlea considering the physical properties of the basilar membrane where it is narrower and stiffer at the base. It is looser and longer at the apex. And if you're like me, you're saying, okay, that seems super backwards. And when you look at that little shell, the base looks like it's a little bit wider and thicker. Uh, we're going to see uh, why this is. So here we're coming back to that cochlea, and I have pulled a picture where I've, I've pulled out just the piece where we can look at the cochlea and the shell. And it looks right, if we look at the base where it starts, it looks like it's a bit wider and thicker, bigger, than when we get up to the apex, when we get up to that little inner part of the shell. But if we look at what's actually happening, so I've pulled this shell out flat and created this really not very good picture, but it is what it is. So if we look at what it looks like, the base is wider and the apex is narrower. If you look at what's happening in the red, the red being the basilar membrane, what it's doing is it is narrower and stiffer at the base. Um, basically, some of that is uh, muscles are pulling it taut, so it's tight and stiff, and it is looser and longer at the apex. If you've never gone to tinkle on a piano on the different notes on a piano and looked in the back of a piano um, at where those low notes are or where those high notes are, you'll notice that in a piano at the low notes, those strings are longer and looser. And when you get up to the high notes and you're going ting -ling -ling -ling, those high notes, they are shorter and they're tighter. Okay, this is basically we have a piano in our ears, but it goes from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz is the ability to respond to. And it's going what seems a little backwards for what's going on, what, how the cochlea looks, but it is because the basilar membrane is running the other direction. Okay, and I'm hoping this makes sense and you will ask questions if it does not make sense. And so if we think about 
let me see if my next slide. As we get to this coding for pitch and this place theory, which is sometimes called traveling wave theory, again, coming from Jorg von Bikesi, basically what that means is that uh, because there's a certain place where they're along the basilar membrane that has the maximal displacement, it gives us what's called a tonotopic organization. So now instead of being retinotopic and organized by where things land on the retina, we're tonotopic and we're organized by the tones, right? Those, how the frequency or pitches of those tones. And so before when we looked at the basilar membrane and I showed how if we, if we straighten out that cochlea and the base is a bit wider than the apex, but with the basilar membrane, that's moving in the opposite direction, right? The base of the basilar membrane is narrower and stiffer than the apex. Well, now I'm spinning that so that instead of seeing that as kind of flattened out and facing us, we're facing it from the side. And you can see from the base to the apex, what we're seeing is that maximal displacement. If we look at the P, where we're seeing the max, that place of maximal displacement, one, two, and three here are showing three different times, time one, time two, time three, as, as we are um, sending that wave of liquid that is affecting the basilar membrane and that place of maximal displacement that's going to tell us this is the pitch that you're listening to and the amount of the how much those hair cells cilia move is going to depend on the amount of displacement of the basilar membrane and again, because of the, that, the characteristics of the basilar membrane, that I am looser and longer, right? That I have more of that um, looser and longer up at the apex. So if we're looking at a 25 hertz tone, which is close to our lowest range of our hearing, you can see that the effect on the basilar membrane, that kind of envelope, uh, we have the most displacement up at the apex. And to a large extent, I'm influencing most of the basilar membrane there. If we move down, and because we're looking at these higher and higher frequencies, and we go all the way down to 1600 hertz, okay, which is um, somewhere just above the middle C, or maybe this the next day up uh, on the piano, we are now affecting the basilar membrane up and up through the base and to sort of the middle, and we're not even affecting the apex at all. So the lower frequency waves are going to be longer, they're reaching farther, they're affecting more of the basilar membrane. As we get to higher and higher frequencies, um, if we get above our, our sound on the piano, the first, the highest sound on the piano is something like 4,186 hertz, something like that. I might be, it might be, I might be teeny tiny bit off there, but um, then we're getting closer and closer to the bass. And as we get to those really high pitched sounds that aren't musical anymore, we're really only affecting the bass. I'm going to go through the um, evidence relatively quickly because you don't need to know the evidence. It's just, but it's here for you that we do have evidence for place theory. One is that they have measured the tonotopic map of a guinea pig cochlea. You can see that as we get up to the um, point in the apex in the very center, 60, 75 hertz, these lower frequencies, and it's slowly getting higher and higher as we move down and as we get towards the base uh, they have the 7000 hertz another nice piece of evidence for place theory is um, this measurement of the frequency tuning curves of the um, of the neurons in the auditory nerve and so we can do this kind of let's remember the frequency the tuning curves that we saw for like vertical lines, right? That I'm gonna, I'm a simple cell that responds to a specific vertical line. I'm still gonna have some response, right, to other lines, but it's not gonna be as strong a response. And so if we look here at um, 500 hertz is a nice one to pick. And if you use decimal five kilohertz, you can see that particular neuron, there's a neuron that responds best. It's down there under um, 40 decibels and it will respond. And so um, that's going to be the frequency that I respond to the best, but 
I still do respond to other frequencies, right? If I'm down at 400, I just need that to be a little bit louder for me to, to respond to that. If it's up towards 1,000, I respond, but if I can find that 1,000 mark, it needs to be at almost 60 decibels. Um, so we do have these frequency tuning curves. I respond best at the lowest, I have the lowest threshold, this neuron, for 500 hertz. I will just add here that this looks like we get narrower frequency ranges on these neurons as we get up in the um, 20,000, 10,000, 20,000 range. But actually notice that the X axis here is compressed. And so um, that's not the opposite is happening. And it's just an old, old picture that I haven't um, gotten the JPEG for the new, for a better, a better picture without that compression. And I am again briefly going to go through the updating of Bikesi. We do need to update Bikesi because those peak vibrations on the basilar membrane are more sharply localized than what he dis, what he suggested. And if we ask the question why, well, he was looking at he built that model from the um, cochlea of cadavers, right, of dead animals. And so the outer hair cells were all dead. And um, he was just looking at the response of the basal membrane. And what we found right was that those outer hair cells are acting as a cochlear amplifier, that they are. If I'm being pushed and pulled a lot as an outer hair cell, I'm going to push and pull on the basal membrane at that spot and have that motile response. So I'm actually making the basal membrane I'm sharpening those frequency tuning curves, basically.